Greetings and welcome to the first of many and more yet to come, the inaugural Legacy Arts Project podcast. That's the cheers. That's the cheers. Yes, we're going to get a sound effect in there for that. But this has been a while in the making. We've been excited about having a podcast because we were interested to be able to tell the good news of all of the work that is happening in Pittsburgh inside of the Africana arts community. So this podcast will be a place for us to discuss events, ideas, artists, topics, and issues that affect the black arts and the Africana arts community of Pittsburgh. And hence, this podcast we are starting today to launch to talk about the work of legacy arts, the work that we do to preserve and promote traditions and cultures of the African diaspora, and using our arts and culture as tools for healing and transformation. Those are the things that we will be talking about on this podcast. So we are excited to be here, as you can tell. Thank you for joining us. Yes, yes, yes. Yay, we really are excited. This is a big thing. This has been many weeks and months and probably years in the making, and we now have a team that has enabled us to pull this together. So thanks to everyone who has been a part of this, and we are going to be moving right into our day with our podcast today. So we are here today to talk about our wellness conference. Our wellness conference is coming up on April the 2nd at the Home at Rushton YMCA, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. We will have activities for the community, bringing together artists and wellness practitioners to share all of the things that they do in order to bring health and wellness into our communities. We are inviting the community to join us. So you will hear a little bit more about that today as we invite and welcome our inaugural guest to our podcast today, a dear friend of ours. And I'm going to pass it to our co-host, I am Erin Perry, and our co-host is Patricia Ford. Passing it to you, Patty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this inaugural podcast. And our first guest, drum roll, is Lakeisha Wolf. Yes, yes. Lakeisha is a first-generation Pittsburgher, and she developed her roots across the community, working at the intersection of arts and culture, social entrepreneurship, community development, and wellness for 20 years. She's also the founding member of the Hill District-based nonprofit Ujima Collective. If anyone knows anything about Ujima Collectives, then, man, you already know. And if you don't know, you need to go out there. And she served as an executive director there since 2013. Uh, Lakeisha is also a cultural worker, a creative entrepreneur, and a teaching artist. Um, she's also known for helping Africana women make healthy and informed choices around beauty product consumption combined with self environmental awareness. Welcome, k- uh, welcome, <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <all good>. <laughs> <laughs> thank to our you. first podcast. Thank you, thank you. I'm excited to be here, excited to be with my sisters always in conversation. And you know, I'm also what's not what you didn't read is that I've been a legacy member, yes. for probably almost as long, um, a good 15 years, um, something like that. Been dancing with my sisters for a long time. So this is, you know, it's, I'm just home. Yes. yes, and that's the wonderful thing about you being here because we are more than just friends. We are sisters, mm-hmm. and that's an awesome thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And we will get in a little bit more detail about your relationship with Legacy. Yes. But we wanted to just start off with a few questions to ask our ask us or to ask you about yourself. <laughs> okay. All right, Don't ask let's me about go. me. I'm asking you about okay. you. Is so it twenty we, questions? Yeah, well, not quite twenty, but no. <laughs> just about uh, no, no. Not, not quite twenty. But we just want to know. The first thing that we want to know is, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, Lord have mercy! You know, I got <laughs> stories. So. I will tell you that, um, so I graduated from Oliver High School on the north side, and um, the little bit that I knew about, like, culture and race and racism, you know, like, issues that were impacting the the community, um, the little bit that I knew coming out of high school, I knew that I wanted to change the way that black people were viewed on the nightly news, right? And when I and when when I was in high school, I was um, in the journalism club, and you know had a really awesome opportunity actually to like interview Kobe Bryant before he got drafted. <laughs> 
<laughs> to to the NBA um, when he was coming out of high school because we graduated the same year, um, or or maybe he graduated the year before and I was after that. I was either a junior or senior, but so I was I was interested in in writing and interested in in telling the the stories of Black people, and I was really impacted by Darith Chisholm on Channel 11. And so, you know, her as, you know, there weren't very many um, black women who I saw on the nightly news. Um, and so she was an inspiration for me at that time. So I went to Penn State with a full rise scholarship in the College of Communications to study broadcast journalism. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to change how when you watch the news, right, we, we, we are obviously constantly bombarded with propaganda that's very anti-black. Mm -hmm. And um, and I always felt like, you know, you see these really negative stories of black people on TV, um, you know, some some crime that, that somebody is, um, you know, accusing you of, and that backstory is never told, right? Like, even if that person is, is innocent, you know, after they showed the picture and told that that name, right? There's never any, um, there's never any apology. There's never any right after you've dragged black people through the mud, right? Um, but but just the ways in which that constant barrage of like imagery and messaging impacts us, um, and and really impacts how we think about ourselves, right? Because what what I was seeing on TV did not actually match my lived experience, right? Like it was so much more diverse. It was so much more rich with pleasurable and awesome things black people were doing, mm -hmm. right? And so I was like, yeah, this isn't right. And so that's what I wanted to change. Um, but when I got into my major, you know, I was really good at what I was doing. Um, but I recognized that there was a total disconnect between, right, the, the, the messaging of America, right, that, that is trickled down even into our, like, institutions of higher, like, education and the ways in which they'll tell you, you know, well, if you do this, it'll lead to that, and then you do that, and you can live the, out this, like, American dream, Right. But when I got into my major and was doing the work, I recognized that the path that they tell you to follow um, to be a journalist, to be a reporter, to be an anchor woman, there wasn't room for the change that I wanted to see in the world <laughs> through myself. Right. Um, and so my my experience at Penn State um, was a rude awakening, um, being in central Pennsylvania, getting death threats when I was the uh, president of the Black uh, Caucus there, you know, the Black Student Union. Um, and so my my whole, you know, I feel like my whole life um, was confronted with a, with a reality of American culture that, um, that I recognized, okay, I, I'm not going to be able to do the traditional route to, to, to change the things that, that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not doing that. But, you know, I've, I've found other ways. Um, I've, I've discovered other ways to use my gifts, skills, and talents. And so that's what I've been doing. Okay. So that's fascinating to know. All these years that I've known you, I never knew about this Kobe Bryant interview. I, I didn't either. I was going to say the same thing. Never heard that. Never knew that, but that's pretty... <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. But I'm also curious about in this this process of coming to understand what you wanted to do and then realizing that you couldn't do it there. How did your path change? What did how did you decide that you and then what did you decide that you wanted to do? <laughs> you know, there's not really Aaron, there's not really like a um like a clear cut path and a mm -hmm. clear cut answer to what you're asking me. Right. I honestly feel like um, because even today, right, like when people think of I, I guess when people think about me, if people are thinking about me. Right. You know, people were like, oh, you know, she's she's a business owner. And for me, no way did I ever see myself being a business owner. And even today, I don't even define myself with that title. Right. Right. I'm more so focused on my purpose, and I think that um, early on, 
you know, in my in my early 20s, you know, coming out of college, it was more of a focus on what am I here to do, right? Like what what is what is the difference that I'm supposed to make in the world? And I felt like if I focused on that, everything else, like whatever job I was going to have, right? Because I didn't really, you know, when you look around and again, you know, as young people, you receive these messages about, you know, go to school, graduate, right. go to college, right. graduate, get a good job. And I feel like that's what, you know, to, to no fault of their own, right? Like that's what my parents set me on the path to do. But honestly, I feel like um, I was open to, like, hearing the creator talk to me and, 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 and hearing, um, you know, like, developing a relationship with my, with my ancestors and just, you know, and wanting to be really grounded in my purpose. And so that's what I focused on. And so, you know, so much of, I, I honestly believe that sometimes even, like, and this is for, I think, all human beings, but oftentimes, like, what you're here to do also is the thing sometimes that challenges you the most right. in your life, right? right? Like, there's mm -hmm. this relationship between, um, you know, like, coming to, to Earth and whatever your early challenges, traumas, and things are, that also is, like, the testimony, right? So as you work on yourself to, to overcome those, those, those challenges mm -hmm. in your life, it becomes the blessing that you have to offer other right. people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what I recognized um, my purpose was... Um, was to be a healer. And, you know, and when I say that I'm a healer, the way that I define that um, is that, you know, I feel like I've been granted, um, right, these gifts and these tools to help to reconnect things that, that have been broken, um, that, that I'm here to, to help people um, to uh, remember who they are, mm -hmm. right? Why they were brought to earth in the first place right. in this body as, mm -hmm. as themselves, mm -hmm. right? With whatever name you have, right? Like words have power, names mm -hmm. have power. Um, and, you know, and all of that is, is your gift to the world, right? right. And so, um, so, you know, I feel like early on, I was just on a path of self-discovery mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, um, and the challenges that I had early on with, you know, varying kinds of traumas, the work that I needed to do that, that I learned that I needed to do and that I've been, um, you know, like just committed to my own healing path, my own healing journey, mm -hmm. that that just became the, the, the thing that I could offer other people. Right. right. So even myself mm -hmm. as as like a black girl, yeah. right? Like being a black girl in in a in a in an environment that was most mostly white, right? And I felt, and this is like early on in Pittsburgh. You know, when I was born, my parents lived in Squirrel Hill. Um, my parents are from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and um, so I didn't grow up with like extended family right. and all of that, right? Um, and so I felt very isolated and, you know, we were one of very few black families in Squirrel Hill. Mm -hmm. And when, when I went to Colfax, right, there were black kids in Colfax, but they were bussed into right. the neighborhood right. mm -hmm. yeah. from Hazelwood, mm -hmm. right, and maybe a few other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, right, the school day's done and I got Jewish friends, <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? Right. So, um, and so that there, you know, there was a lot of struggle around identity and things early on for me. Um, you know, struggles around my hair. Like I, I remember crystal clear a very early experience of riding on this on the school bus on like a field trip, and there being like this this little white girl riding in front of me, right, and the windows were down, and seeing her her little blonde hair blow in the wind, in the wind right, mm -hmm. and right. Um, and thinking, you know, because. I would have these, you know, I always had long hair or whatever, but, you know, it was always braided. And I remember distinctly thinking, I wish my hair blew in the wind the yeah. the way this does, mm -hmm. right? Because these were the internalized mm -hmm. beauty standards of white exactly. of white supremacy, yeah, right? All had. That yeah. we all were, so, you know, and yeah. still are very much subjected to mm -hmm. all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, on my path of growing up, right, those are the things that I began to really confront with myself, yes, right? Yes, like, yes. what is the root 
mm-hmm. of this? Like, how did we get here? Mm-hmm. Why Why am I even thinking this, right? Because they become very harmful thoughts, mm-hmm. right? Because even, you know, uh, Patty, when you read my, my bio, right, a part of my journey was accepting myself as myself, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. And, and, and recognizing even not even just the psychological harm that that comes with trying to meet and live up to a beauty standard that's not our own, right? Mm -hmm. But also the, you know, because we live in and have been subjected to such a, a harmful system of capitalism, right? Like the things that businesses do to like exploit people and, and particularly black people in, in order to get our dollar and prey on our insecurities right, right. as yep. black women about our hair mm-hmm. or our skin, mm-hmm. right? And that, and that because of that, right, then we get subjected to all of the chemical mess, all of the toxic craziness right. that are inside of these products mm-hmm. and then our health, right, has been at jeopardy. Right. And that that black women and particularly black girls even right are going into puberty earlier because of the 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 cumulative effect of all of these chemicals. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's just there's just so much. Right. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, that is what informed my journey. And it's what then informed. Right. The 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 gift that I've been able to offer other people. Right. Other black women. That, you know, in, you know, having sister circles and us learning how to love ourselves and right, affirm each other, seeing the God in one another and being like, hey, sister, like your hair is beautiful. Yes. Right. Yes. And and it's crazy mm-hmm. because, you know, early on when when I, you know, decided to not use, um, you know, relaxers anymore, I was probably like 19 and, you know, I was a student still at Penn State Um but there was not yet a natural hair movement, right? Right. right. So, like, there, there was no, you know, you couldn't just Google natural hair and get a whole bunch no. of tips and products. No. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, how do I use this Luster's Pink Lotion, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, <laughs> right. that I grew up with, yeah. right, with permed hair on, you know, my developing kinks and curls, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, I, and, and honestly, like, I, I remember coming home on like a school break one time Mm -hmm. and like passing my mom in the hallway of where we lived in, you know, and asking her, do you like my hair? And her telling me no. Mm. Right. Yeah. And, um, and having to like "Mm," swallow that. Yeah. Right. Because, right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then also having to like offer my mother, right. The grace and the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, Mm -hmm. She grew up in a time right. where this was this was the beauty standard, and right. you needed to look a certain kind of a way, right? Like when when I transitioned my hair, you know, I'm I'm at Penn State, like in my senior year, doing like these Saturday morning like live. Well, no, it wasn't live, but it was taped and then played on a live broadcast in Center County, mm-hmm. right? And I'm just like, okay, I don't know how to, what I'm going to do with my hair, right? Yeah. Like, okay, mm-hmm. we're making these videos of me doing these newscasts, mm-hmm. and what am I going to do, yeah. right? Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't even remember what I did, but I definitely wasn't straightening right. my hair. Right. And it was an issue that you were self-conscious about that you had to... Right. Really exactly. But but also that I didn't have anybody to talk to about right. that. Right. There was nobody mm-hmm. to communicate mm-hmm. that right. that internal yeah. battle and struggle mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I'm I'm so grateful for, like the evolution and the growth of our community, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. all of us, like across Mm -hmm. the country, across the nation, the world even, but even right here in Pittsburgh, right? Like people like Sister Tamaya Bridget and 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 other sisters who right who who stepped out on faith and said, we're gonna do this work. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I, Mm -hmm. you know, big shout out to um, New Voices Pittsburgh and their Kinks Locks and Twist Mm -hmm. conference. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that 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 was really one of my first opportunities. And they always brought that to, to our share. Women's History Month. Yes, yeah. Yeah. right. Exactly. Which is this Be- month. Between yep. February mm-hmm. and March, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, like it was my first opportunity to like share all of this work that I had been doing, not just with myself, but, you know, launching my own product line. Because my own product line, right, Emos, yes. um, natural hair, uh, natural body hair care products, it, it, it actually was just me sharing with other people 
right? Like this thing that I felt like was saving my life. Like I saw, you know, so when I talk about not wanting to be or not ever seeing myself as a business person, like I didn't go into business because that's what I wanted to do. Like I, I was making products for myself right. because Mm -hmm. Pink Lusters wasn't doing it for right, me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, I had to figure mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when, when I started with, with my hair, it was like, okay, well, what else am I putting on my body? Yes. What, you know what I mean? True. Like, what mm -hmm. am I exposing myself to every single right. day, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And so then it was like, you know, and then I'm in community. Right, right. And, and, I, and I know I've also experienced your products. Of course, Shea Butter, you can buy it at the co-op yes. amongst other places. Right, at Ujima. At, at Ujima and directly from Sister Lakeisha, but also your body products in addition, the scrubs mm -hmm. and some of the other products that you have made. And it makes it brings me to our wellness conference. Right. And even being able to continue on with sharing the work that you do, the gifts and, and skills that you have that you share through Ujima and through our wellness conference this year, Ujima is a partner of mm -hmm. ours. And Ujima and Sister Lakeisha will be bringing workshops as well as vending tables of different artists and men members of Ujima who will be sharing their products. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that Ujima will be bringing into the wellness conference? Oh, for yeah. sure, for sure. So we're still uh, crystallizing the the schedule, right? The but details. Um, but we're we're definitely hoping to bring um, specifically some some education and some some experiences for our community around um, women's health and women's womb health, right? One of our newest members of Ujima is uh, Dorisa King, who mm -hmm. operates Yoni Steam 412. Yeah, shout out Yoni Steam 412. Yes, <laughs> yes, saving Getting lives, saving them wombs every day. Real. Um, and so that sister and, um, you know, we, we have, um, you know, when we, let me just back up a little bit. So when we did our, uh, our newest launch for members, um, the, the fall, fall of last year, we, we wanted to, you know, one of our principles and values um, is also wellness. And um, because, you know, for, for us, like, while we I know a lot of people know us because we have this retail boutique, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they know that, oh, okay, these are artists and makers, right? But, you know, a lot of the work that we do um, when we talk about, like, cooperative economics, right, because Ujama means co cooperative mm -hmm. economics, um, it's really about... Um, remembering our value, right? And our value beyond dollars and cents, right? Mm -hmm. Because so much of the healing that I believe black people um, and African, Africana people, right, need is a lot of it, particularly if you're a black person who lives in the Americas, right, in, in the United States, that so much of our struggle is rooted in the fact that we were the commodity bought and right, sold right. and traded, right? Mm -hmm. And that that generational trauma, mm -hmm. that 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 legacy, still impacts us, mm -hmm. right? Today, and that yeah. and that even when when we get into business and, and we want to be like entrepreneurs, that like those things creep up, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes mm -hmm. we don't even identify it for what it is, right? And so I feel like within Ujima, a part of our sweet spot is like, you know, not just saying like, oh, we can help you write a business plan and oh, you know, and there's a lot of folks. I think Pittsburgh has a great ecosystem for like black entrepreneurs, right? We definitely have it going on. But our sweet spot is like, you know, I always tell people every day, if, if we never sell another product, if we can increase the value and the wellness that black people feel, partic particularly black women, right? Like we've done our job, yes. right? right? Mm -hmm. That like, if, if sisters feel like they are enough, yes. right? That how they show up in the world, what mm -hmm. they look like, what they bring head, yes, head yes, to yes. toe, mm -hmm. right? Is okay. And mm -hmm. actually it's not just mm -hmm. okay, it's awesome, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? Like there's nothing about you that needs to change. Like right. you, you, you can just let go of whatever baggage. Right. And yes. so right? what are some of the ways that you affirm that and bring that through Ujima? <laughs> well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we 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 spend a lot of time like in our membership meetings doing like personal development. We we do a lot of affirmation of, of, of sisterhood and of relationships. Right. We we center our wellness. We do a lot of breathing, a lot of grounding work mm -hmm. um, so that those things that 
that we've been carrying, right, that aren't really of us but have impacted us so that we can have the, the, the time to move those things out mm-hmm. of us, right? Because when we can do that, then we create the room for all of the good stuff, right. all of the joy, exactly. all of the pleasure, all mm-hmm. of the great things we deserve, mm-hmm. right? That that we have space for for those things. Mm-hmm. So for for us, we see ourselves as being contributors to you know communities that are healthy for the minds, bodies and spirits of mm-hmm. people of African descent, yes. right? Yes. And so we in our membership, we said we we want to do a call to, you know, all types of creative sisters, right? Doing all kinds of things. But a special call to sisters who are specifically working within the wellness industry, Mm -hmm. right? Like creating products and services that can help our community get ourselves together, yes, mind, body, yes. and spirit. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're so fortunate to be partnering with Ujima yes, for the yeah. Wellness Conference is really to be able to bring all of these gift skills and talents of our community mm-hmm. into a central place yeah. so that our community can come and take part in what mm-hmm. is already here yes. and available yes. that's right here at in our community yeah. that is a tool that are tools for our own healing and well-being. And these sisters right. are dynamic. Yes. Okay. So um, I mentioned Sister Dor- Dorisa, um, Sister Queen with Royally Fit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she also does a lot of uh, like herbal and plant and plant based products. Okay. Um, Sister Maria Kent with Ogechi, you know, around natural hair care. Mm-hmm. She she's actually um, her offering is for the young people um, and is going to, um, you know, really engage young people in some conversations. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Right, because she has a, a, a son team. who's fourteen, right. Right. and so you know he's he's helped to inform this workshop that mm-hmm. that she plans on on offering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that um, was one of the things I was going to ask you about for the wellness uh, conference, as far as the the youth, which mm-hmm. you were going to have for mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Because you know, a big part of our wellness as Black people mm-hmm. is our ability to accept ourselves as African. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's that's like another part of our healing. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that like, you know, I was thinking about Brother Amir, our elder storyteller. Right. And, yes. and, and, and he so, will actually be I'm the sure he'll be there, he of, be. of course. But yes. I always think about him and he always shares that um, that famous proverb, I guess. I don't even know, if it's, you know, but that. A quote or whatever it is, but he always says, like you know, kittens born in an in an oven doesn't make them biscuits, right? Right, and so African people born in another place in the world doesn't make them not African, right? And so we have to like you know, some horrible things have been done to us historically to separate ourselves from ourselves, right? right? Mm-hmm. And and there's been like. <sighs> centuries of anti-black propaganda mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that, um, you know, we, we've we internalized white supremacy right. in a Everyone way has. that, mm-hmm. you know, like white folks don't even have to be around, mm-hmm. that, we, you know, we've subjected ourselves to to these things, right? right. And so we have a responsibility to, to create the kinds of environment that affirm not just our children, yes. but also the adults, right? right? Yes. Because we all the need it at, at the whole, the whole community. community. The whole community. But mm-hmm. if if we can start with our children, right? So one of the things that I'm offering at the wellness conference is um, is a cultural play date for our little people, right? Yes. Like so, age three to nine, ten. We're going to have fun, right? And we're going to do things that affirm them as, as, as African children yes. in song and dance and movement and art and crafts, mm-hmm. right? Um, and just have fun being okay with who we are. Yes. yes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Yes, exactly. um, you know, I've been doing um, some of these workshops through Ujima and um, over the last couple of years and in, in different partners in the in the community and it's just been so much fun right and I you know I have I still have little people I have a five-year-old and a ten-year-old she's almost not little anymore right <laughs> but um yeah you know we we have a sweet spot for the little people right because yeah, of course they're, Definitely. they're the promise for tomorrow right, and we have to remember yes. why we doing yes. this this work so we got to create work for them too yes. mm-hmm. the children certainly are the future yes they, they are definitely yep. are they definitely are 
Um, but Keisha, the one thing I wanted to ask you is how did your past even cross with the Legacy Arts Project? Ooh, I'm like, Aaron, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I feel like I was like a late bloomer when it came to like my creativity. And I always wanted to, like, as a kid, like, I always wanted to dance. Like, I wanted to be in gymnastics. But, like, my mom didn't really, I think one year, maybe when I was in the seventh grade, I was, like, a color guard. But the cost of being in the color guard was so expensive. Right. So I couldn't do it past past a year. Because, you know, you got to buy the outfit mm -hmm. and buy this and buy yeah. that. And my yeah, mom just couldn't up. afford it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so, so I didn't have those experiences, you know, but then and I remember going to my first dance class, which I want to say might have been at the Homewood YMCA and um, <laughs> Brother Thomas Chapman and um, sister and Desiree, Des Desiree <laughs> was we're, we're teaching, we're, we're co-teaching together. Uh -huh. And I remember my, my rhythm was all off. Oh, my God, <laughs> it was so off. Right. Because I just had never been. Exposed. Embraced yeah. and exposed mm -hmm. right. in that way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But um, Lord have mercy, I've come <laughs> a long way. You know what I'm saying? I tapped into my polyrhythmic self through through those experiences. So that's that's how that's how it started, right? Like that was my first introduction with like okay. Af with African dance. Okay, and I was probably like maybe 22. Okay. Perhaps I don't remember. But like, <laughs> because I met Aaron, so I met Aaron. We went together. Yeah, we did. We did go. We did go together. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because you know when I met Aaron. So Aaron is four years older than me. And when I met Aaron, we actually met in. I just want to tell the story because <laughs> we, we we met in in Market Square, um, and we have a friend through Sankofa. Um, Brian, who lives in uh, New, New Jersey now, but he, uh, we we were doing Sankofa circles at Pitt, and um, and I guess Brian had met Aaron first, and I n had never seen her before, and so w there was um, we were having this like community event for for young people down in Market Square. There was like a stage, and there were these performances, and I, I remember Brian being like, "Oh yeah, Keisha, I want to introduce you to this sister named Aaron," and it was like. I don't know. We just like fell in love as sisters. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> it was like what Been in together the world? ever since. Exactly. We sure have. You know what I mean? And it was crazy because I don't even really remember the like development of our relationship. It was just like this immediately. Yeah, just like right. Yeah. And and it's so funny because um, yeah, like we so we went to that first dance class together. And then at some point, we heard about Legacy and um, Sister Imani, and we went to she she was having her classes at Kingsley, yep. and we went to 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 a class at Kingsley, and then we just kept we just kept it. going back, you know what right. I mean? And then as Sister Imani wanted to transition out of her leadership, right? She tapped Aaron, <laughs> like Aaron, uh, I need you to be the leader. Um, oh, great. Yeah, and so, sure. you know, and, and it's so interesting <laughs> because even, you know, around that time, you know, like Ujima, I think we started organizing Ujima um, in 2008, right? Sister Salita Hickman put out the call in 2008, and yeah. we came together, right? And it was just so interesting because even as, like, directors of nonprofit organizations, right, me and Aaron were just kind of, like, both doing it at the same time, like, having to learn, um Building the building the plane as we fly, right? <laughs> Pretty right. much, and building the plane, learning how to fly, like all of that. North, south, east, right. west. <laughs> Where are we going? Yeah, and so you know, it's been it's been a really beautiful journey. You know what I mean? And so, legacy has offered me so many wonderful experiences um, that have like even like intersected so many of the things I'm really passionate about. Okay. Right. So beyond just like dance but like really like storytelling right. yes um you know i've mm -hmm. always been interested in like theater and acting so you know whenever we <laughs> we've done the keepers of the flame yep. performances it. <laughs> right um it's been so fun because right like we get to co-create those mm -hmm. things together yes. right yeah. and um 
I, you know, I think about this all the time because I was just watching um, the YouTube video of um, Little Haiti on the Hill. Oh, yes. Right? Of the Flame yes. 2013. Yes. Check it out on YouTube. One yes. of my favorite. <laughs> yes, one of my favorite things. Aaron remembers all the days. <laughs> right. All the days. And, you know, I've already <laughs> forgiven you guys for not giving me co-producer it credits. On, it wasn't on there? No. <laughs> Were there credits? I'm just saying on, <laughs> on the program, on the video, right? Because I worked Were with there any credits? I worked no. Well, no, I was like, wait, were there credits? Well, in the program, right? Like, I'm just saying. Was there a program? No, I'm just saying. Yeah, there was a program. <laughs> well, you have co producer credits. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I just gave them we, to we, myself. We, we, yeah. we, we, to we moved to amend the 2013 Keep yes. the Flame program booklet to include Lakeisha Wolf. All as in favor say aye. Aye. Yes. Second to aye. Because, <laughs> and, and, and I say that because, right, like, and very recently, somebody um, kind of like helped me to like, solidify that in my mind around being a producer, mm -hmm. right? Like all of these things that I've done in my life, right? Because I feel like I've always struggled even with the title like artist, yes. right? Like, yes. because I just didn't like, I didn't fit inside of a box mm -hmm. of like what I thought or what I feel like society always says like an artist is, right? right. Like I always knew that I was creative, but like it took me a very long time to see myself as an artist, yeah, right? Yeah, and I think we all can agree yeah. and attest yeah. to that, right? right. right. Yeah. And I think yes. that's probably why in the 2013 booklet, Nobody was listed as anything in particular. Yeah. Right. So even when, you know, I sat there to create the booklet mm -hmm. for myself, very similarly, I didn't see myself as an artist or even to give myself any title on right. there. So everybody's like, just even listed producer as the cast. Wise, like, right. Yeah. So right, yeah. Right, we right. produce we all a lot of the cast. Stuff, but we, but yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I think, you know, like there's room for not doing it, but then there's also right. room for doing it, Which right? Which that was nine years ago. So right. since that time, we have evolved to yes, <laughs> yes, we are a bit better. Right, right, right. able to, to take credit for the work that we yes. do and give credit where credit likewise is due. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, yeah. the one thing about that that specific performance, that that piece we put together, right, it, it told... It, it weaved in the stories around the Hill District, yes, right? Like right. contemporary, like mm -hmm. Lower Hill, mm -hmm. right? And we recruited folks from yes. the Hill District mm -hmm. to be in that yeah. part of the yeah. show, mm -hmm. right? And then, right, we had our whole Sankofa and we went back and told this, this wonderful story about the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, yes. Yeah. right? Yes. And we're able to do that through like the influence of like Afro Caribbean yes. dance, yes. right? And it was just such a beautiful and Phenomenal. just like rest in peace it to really Brother was. Kwame. Yes. Rest in peace. Kwame, Ross. Kwame Ross. Yes. You know, it was such a beautiful time. You know, there was a lot of energy oh, going lot on. Lot that was day. that that was that year the uh, the deer year crash. The year of the deer. Oh, <laughs> the year of the deer. Yeah, the year yes. multiple yes. deer crashes. Yes. Multiple. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, did, I just wanted to to say that you know, through that time, we were able to host our first residency where we brought in Baba Kwame Ross, mm -hmm. and it was very intense. There was lots of energy moving. We were able lots to engage in community mm -hmm. in different spaces, so from Sankofa Village to the Y to uh, the we Hosanna House. Uh, yeah. Kelly Strayhorn. Kelly Strayhorn. Um, Dance, oh, their 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 at dance, Alloy. yeah, at the Alloy. Yeah, so we were able to, and that was sort of like a jump off for our residencies. Mm -hmm. And through that, we've been able to continue to progress, mm -hmm. continue to grow, continue to evolve and heal. Mm -hmm. Because yes. in those times, you know, just being able to come into the space and to create work and still have like a certain insecurity and doubts and right. uncertainty, but still pushing through nevertheless. Right, right. And that becomes the ways that we continue right. what's, to what's cultivate it say on, ourselves. On the cup? It, it always, always works out. out. <laughs> and it always does. <laughs> yes, yeah. and so we wanna thank you. We yes. wanna thank you for being our first guest yes. on our inaugural podcast. We have many more to come and we would like to invite you back again oh, because I know you got much more oh, to yeah. share. And let me know if you ever need a, an extra co-host. Yes. I got questions for yes. people. Yes, okay. yes. And <laughs> you, can, you can join us as a co-host and we have many plans for taking it to the streets and going to different places and mm -hmm. meeting people where they are and really being able to shine a light on the work that's being done in Pittsburgh and have conversations around how are we doing the work of bringing health and wellness into our own lives, mm -hmm. passing it into our families, yes. and creating new patterns for our families so and important. our communities? Yes. Yeah. So we want to shout out our wellness conference again yes. on April 2nd come through, at come 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Yes. in partnership with the Ujima Collective. We will have 
various guests who are facilitating workshops. We will have performances mm -hmm. by local youth and adults in the community mm -hmm. and just work of being able to come together and feel good right. and to bring joy into our community and celebrate arts of the mm -hmm. African diaspora as ways to bring healing into our community. So we want to give thanks to you yet again and to our producers mm -hmm. who are Thank here, yes. to our host, to Patty and myself, yes. and to yes. our, our producers who are on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I wish you could see them. They're over there mm -hmm. all mic'd up and yes. doing yes. the thing. Doing the so, thing. So excited about <laughs> all of this. And so before you go, we have one last question. We would like to ask, if you were a vegetable, what would you be? Ooh. <laughs> hmm. Um, a veggie, what veggie, veggie, veggie. You know, I think maybe I'd be some kale. Mm -hmm. Um, what's it called? The, uh, the, the, the lacinato. Las yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. That's why I didn't say I was like, lacinato. Yes, but the, the, the very dark green, mm -hmm. kind of crunchy looking kale. Mm -hmm. I would be that. Why? So, you know, I'm thinking about the chlorophyll content, okay. like how green it yes. is. Yes. Um, it also makes me think, like, for whatever reason, like, it makes me think about, like, um, like turtles and dinosaurs <laughs> eating that kind oh, of kale. Okay, okay. And so mm -hmm. it makes it's me ancient. feel like it's ancient. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You read my mind. Mm -hmm. That's why you're my sister <laughs> from another right. mister. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it just makes me feel like it's been a long, it's been around for a really yeah, long time, yeah. you know, and I feel like my spirit's been around for a really long time. So, um, yeah, I'd be that kale. Well, thank you, okay. kale. <laughs> Keisha kale. And thank you yet again hey, for joining us for our inaugural podcast. Stay tuned for what's coming up next. We will have guests each month as we do our podcast. So stay tuned and thank you yet again. Yes. Peace and blessings. Peace. Peace, Peace out. Mm -hmm.